Whenever life would start getting good for me, God would throw a nice anchor and stop me right there. So I'm going through pararescue training and there's this evolution called water confidence. Mm -hmm. And water confidence is pretty much what gets people kicked out of special, you know, special forces, special operations is the water. Mm -hmm. And they try to drown you, pretty much. <laughs> I, this was not in the warning order. So I didn't know anything about water confidence. Long story short, what it is is they put 16 pound weight belts on you, whatever they can do to make you uncomfortable in the water. So for six weeks of a 10 week program, I became very uncomfortable. We got down to about 25, 30 guys left. I was one of them. And getting near graduation of this program, I'm thinking, my God, I'm about to get through this. Mm -hmm. Barely though, water confidence is killing me. Right. They took me to medical. They, they, they drew my blood and realized I have sickle cell. Yeah. So sickle cell is a blood disease sure. that some African-Americans have, which is not good. No. So they took me out training for a week. And when you go from being uncomfortable, that's your lifestyle, you get used to being uncomfortable. Right. When you go back to being comfortable, your mind says, I don't want to go back to sure. being uncomfortable again. That's right. So I was like, I don't want to go back to the water. So my whole mindset was, I want to get out of this training. So I was hoping that they were going to medically disqualify me from pararescue program. That didn't happen. A week later, the doc called me in the office and said, hey, guess what, man? We're going to put you back in the training. I was like, okay, well, I missed a week. I got about two and a half weeks left. I can do this. I went back to the, you know, to the CEO, the command officer. He said, hey, guess what? We're going to start you back from day one. And when he said that to me, my mind went back to the old David Goggins. So I thought I had changed. Learning, learn how to swim, learn how to read and write. All I was doing was attacking the surface. I wasn't getting down into the dungeon of what was really bothering me. So whenever like, like, tough times would happen, any tough time that was like really tough time that would happen, I would go back to the sewer of my mind. So this happened, I went back to lying. I said, hey, you know what, CEO? This guy, you know, the doc didn't know about sickle cell. He didn't give me a good reason why. He's talking about sudden death, heart attack, stroke. I'm not comfortable. So he gave me a medical from pararescue. So he allowed me to leave, but I, I really quit. I didn't want to go back in the water again. Right. And that's when I went from weighing 175 pounds to 297 in about three wow. and a half years. Wow. So I did a job called TACP, yeah. controlling fast movers behind enemy lines. But that job wasn't a job that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And the spiral of depression, yeah. of trying to find things that I was comfortable doing. And whenever you find things that you're comfortable doing, you're going away from the journey of life. Mm -hmm. And I was going so far away from my journey yeah. that my weight showed my whole mindset. My morning routine is every day I get up and run every single day because why i hate that the most <laughs> so that is where we I share that feeling <laughs> yes i hate that the most so you have to do something that sucks every day because why once you overcome the suck oh now you're powerful you've overcome yourself already so now you're ready to battle i go to the gym about four times a week but my biggest thing i do is my nighttime routine i stretch out anywhere from two to four hours every night for the last five, it used to be a lot longer than that. And I talk about it in my book, why I started doing this thing. But I had, through my whole life, as you see, I was using my fight or flight muscle. I was under severe stress as a child, growing up, my job, whatever, a lot of stress. Just sitting down right now, we're all using our psoas muscle, your hip flexor muscle. And I'll give you a, a two second on that. That muscle attaches to your T12. And about five or six years ago, I got really, really sick. Doctors give me all kind of hormones. Take this, take this, take this. And it's in the book real good, so I won't go deep into it now. But I laid back and I literally said, you know what, I'm dying. The doctors can't figure out what's wrong with me. My blood tests were coming back fine. I just said, I, I, I can't even run a block. I went from running 205 miles, I can't run a block. I'm in my bed sitting there. And I started realizing I had these humongous knots on my hip flexors and in the back of my head. And I said, I'm just done. So I started slowly stretching out. I couldn't do anything. Over a period of a couple of years, I got off this medication, that medication. I was on like 15, I was on several medications. Now I'm on one. And honestly, I, what I believe, no doctor has said, this is what happened to you. I was literally so tight, I was cutting off blood supply in different places in my organs the more it opened up my body. So now I went from running an 830 mile on a training run to now running a 715 to seven minute mile on a training run. 
at the same heart rate. And it's not because I'm trained any different. It's just because my body, my body's opened up. It's allowing more blood flow. So every night I stretch out and it's truly, I used to be wound so f tight. Like I couldn't sit in this chair for this long. I'd be like, I could get, get out of here, man. Maybe I go. It's totally changed my whole perspective of life. It's changed everything. So stretching out, yoga, all those things has put me in a whole different state of mind. It's, and I'm the healthiest I've been in my entire life, mentally and physically. We want to suffer and suffer and go back in the grind. That internal dialogue you have with yourself when you're in misery and you're uncomfortable, it's a real, scary, unfiltered, no lying dialogue between you and yourself. And people know exactly what the f I'm talking about when you're in a bad spot in life and your mind is saying all kind of sh That's who you really are. That's the real you. No Rocky Balboa moments going on up there. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. you know, it's around 14. Let's come on, we got this. No, it's like this, I'm out of here, man. This is crazy. That's where the growth happens. When you're able to stay in that moment and talk to yourself, talk yourself back into the suck of wherever you're going through, and you start stripping those layers away, but as you're stripping those layers away, you're building calluses over top of in your mind. That's where the growth starts to happen, is when you have to force yourself to stay in it. You can't, you can't leave it. I believe in a higher power. Don't know the name, don't know where it's coming from, don't know anything like that. But I believe that this power, and visualize me real quick. Let's say it's a man up there, or a woman, whatever, and they have a chart. And when you're born, they say David Goggins, born February 17th, 1975 at 6 a.m. They write the chart down because they can see everything. They know exactly what you're su supposed to be. They know what you're supposed to be. You die, you go to so-called heaven. You arrive at heaven, I'm 300 pounds. I retired as an Ecolab guy, which is okay, just a job, whatever. I go up there and God looks at me and he shows me my chart. And my chart on there says you were supposed to be a Navy SEAL. You're supposed to weigh 185 pounds. You're supposed to be one of the smartest people on the planet, this, this, all this. You see this. And now you're in heaven, you made it to heaven, but you're like, God, Doug, I was supposed to live that life. I was supposed to live that life. And then you find out that the reason why, because we all think that if we pray on it, if we do this, if we do that, whatever, if we don't work, we just, whatever, it's gonna magically happen for us. No, I believe that when I'm all said and done with, my whole job is to outwork the chart. Whatever the chart says about me, the all-knowing power up there, I want to get up there and say, him look at me and say, I know everything. I didn't see this. I didn't see this. I want to feel that. I want to get to the other end of this world and however I'm being judged, whoever's judging me, to look at me and say, I did not know, I, I had you at 185, I had you at this, but all this other sh I was riding as you were living it. I want to, I want to find more, all I can. And in that sack of sh you have to dive in that to find more. Because if you're not willing to go in there and face yourself, you're not gonna find anything. You can live right here on surface, man, right here on surface. So if there is an ending to this world and there is somewhere to go and there's a judgment, you're gonna get there and you might see a chart and that chart may tell you who the f you should have been. And now you get the rest of your life to think about that. Man, I could have lived a much better life. Like just would have just suffered a little bit more. Let's say for instance, we have a family. Let's say we're all a big family here. All three of us, all four of us are a big family. And every morning I'm getting up training for a 200 mile run. And you see me get up at four o'clock in the morning and all you are sleeping. And by the time I get done running my 30, you come, I come home just getting up. How are you gonna feel about yourself? A lot of times when you're overachiever and you have people, that's what I talk about the mediocrity thing. A lot of our family members, a lot of our friends, they're mediocre. And there's always those couple of guys who are uncommon, who want to be better. But you make that mediocre feel like yeah. Whether it's your mom, your dad, whoever, you make them feel horrible. I've been there, I'm speaking from experience. When you get somebody around you man, who's trying to be better and you don't have the drive that they have, 
it's a constant reminder of how f***ed up you are. You have to know that that's what it is. Anybody in your course not saying, man, get after it, brother. I'm so proud of you. They have a problem with themselves because all you're trying to do is achieve more. If that's a problem for somebody, you have to look at them and say, man, you really have a problem with yourself, huh? And people wonder, why am I not achieving more? It's because once you, all of us, once we achieve something, we celebrate for a long years time. And we wonder, why don't I have drive anymore? Where's it all at? If you don't develop a routine of suffering, and suffering is not like go out and kill yourself every day. It's being uncomfortable. Yeah. That keeps you hungry every day. If you live in your victories for so long and say, I'm going to go challenge myself for 30 days or for two weeks or run this, run this one marathon. And it ends, I did one marathon. Okay. That's why it leaves you. It leaves you because you haven't set up the next obstacle. Obstacles is how you grow. You must continue to have friction. Friction is where growth is at. With no friction, there's no growth. I love that. No growth. A lot of us, mediocrity is everywhere right now. And we're all trying to find an easy way out. And we're judging ourselves. Let's say there's 10 people in this room and we're all mediocre. But I'm the best of the mediocre people. I now think I'm great. I'm great. We surround ourselves around people that make us feel great. They tell us what we want to hear. The second we put ourselves amongst the uncommon people, we don't like that feeling, that challenge and feeling that of, of that person who's waking up at 3.30 in the morning and saying, hey, put your shit on, we're going for a run. We don't like that challenge. We like that person who says, hey, you know what, man, I don't feel good today, man. And they say, oh, it's okay, brother. Take a day off, man, we get a pizza and shit, watch the game. We like that. We, we love that feeling. Why? Because you understand, man, we're good, bro. We don't want that It's like this. Hey, man, no, bro. Get your shit on, man. Stop being a punk. We don't want that in our lives. We don't want that person who's constantly challenging our weaknesses. We want that person who's constantly, you know, making us feel nice and good and secure in ours. That's the mediocrity of life. We want to be the best amongst the average people. People wonder, how do you stay hungry all the time? Because after I accomplish something, I don't sit back like a lot of guys who graduate buds, graduate this, graduate that. They get comfortable. They wonder why I'm getting weak, man. I don't know, I lost my edge. What's going on? Because once you hit the top of the mountain, guess what happened? You're, I'm good. I'm good, so you wonder why you're falling down now. Because once you reach the top of the mountain, you gotta build a another one. That's mediocrity. There's a lot of people in mediocrity who have a nice resume, but they're one-timers, man. They hit, they hit a one-time deal, they busted it open, got a lot of money, but they're good. You're mediocre now, man. What are you doing today, tomorrow, the next day? That's why I don't listen to theorists. I don't listen to all that bullshit. I listen to who's like this, man. What's wrong, man? I'm tired, dude. Why are you tired? Because tomorrow, I gotta do the shit again, man. Whatever the shit is that made me nauseous and sick to my stomach, it made me hurt. There's no ending. And that's the person I listen to. That's the person who's gained knowledge. You gain knowledge through suffering. And on the other end of suffering is a world that very few, very few have ever seen. It's a beautiful world because that's where you find yourself. You don't find yourself in over here. You find yourself on the other end. Like, like the 100 mile race I was on, I ran it for 24 hours. I found myself on the other end of that race. That 19 hours, I found, wow, there's a whole nother world out here that I've never even saw. But the world's in your mind. And that's what all that mediocrity is about. Mediocrity is contagious. The truth of the storyline, we live in a world that's very unauthentic. So who the f are you? What do you stand for? What do you believe in? You know, a lot of people don't like what I say. A lot of people hate that I cuss. A lot of people hate a lot of things about me. I don't give a shit. When you find out who you are, that's when you start living your life. Don't fit in just for the sake of fitting in your life. Make sure that if you have something to say, say it. Social media nowadays is one of the biggest 
forms of being fake in the world. People buy likes, people buy friends, people buy comments, all this bullshit. Make sure in life you do what you have to do, say what you have to say, and live the life you have to live. Don't walk around being a fake human being. Don't be scared to be who you are. Stay hard. Literally, so we get scarred. And the thing about it is like, if you're in, a, in the kitchen and you're cutting up cucumbers, yep. you cut your finger. It happened 30 years ago. That scar is still there. They say, what happened to your finger? Guess what you do? I was in the kitchen one day, I was cutting up cucumbers, you know, cut my finger. Yep. You have those scars on your brain yeah. from life. Yep. But what we don't do is we try to hide those scars. We don't want to go back and revisit it. Mm -hmm. This is not as simple as a cucumber, you know, you know, cutting a cucumber. Mm -hmm. So I started realizing that my life was causing a whole bunch of scarring on my brain. And I had to go back, while I wrote this book, I had to go back and really break open that scar and let it bleed. Mm -hmm. And that was a very painful journey for me to go back. Cause you know, like right now this is all surface. Learning disability, call me nigger. Uh, it's, it's, it's all surface. I get sad, deep sad into that it. a lot of people have dealt yes. with that stuff. Yeah, very right? sad. Yeah. But the way I talk about in the book, I'm, I'm getting your hand yeah. and I'm taking you back there with me. Yeah. As that kid in that classroom who opens up his Spanish notebook, I'm sitting in the back because I had a fourth grade reading level. I'm in the back, I open my Spanish notebook. On the first page, they had a hangman drawing of me saying, nigga, we're gonna kill you. Very back, I'm a sophomore in high school, nothing but white people. I shut that thing up and I leave class. Not giving civilized is about having a savage mentality. Civilized is something where people, um, it's, a, it's, it's a comfortable world. A lot of us say, you know, like for instance, I see these athletes right now who retire, you know, I'm 38, you know, I'm 39, I did 20 years at the top of my game. I'm chilling out now. You see them a year later and how they look. What the hell just happened to you? What the hell? You're one of the greatest athletes of all time. Kids looked up to you. Women, men of all ages looked up to you. And they hit the pinnacle where it's time to retire and their mind says, I'm civilized. The worst thing that could ever happen to any human being is they become civilized. It's that total accountability like even when you retire, there's a m looking at me and judging me right now, man. I'm, I was the baddest person to ever live. It doesn't go away, man. You got to wake up. Even though you retired, you never retired. You're setting the example every single day of your life. And being civilized feels so good. I'm sorry, man. Once you get to the top, you may retire, but you ain't never coming back home, man. Because now you're judged. People see you falling off. You want to be that guy who knows I may be retired from the sport or forever I did, but I'd be damned if you ever see me looking like shit, feeling like shit, not arriving. People, I've arrived. I've arrived mentality. You're always setting the example. Civilization feels so good. These comfortable feelings are what people want. They want retirement. They want that. They need that. They. It's a, it's a yearning feeling. I want it too. People love putting a label on me about, my God, man, you're just wired different. I'm not wired different, dude. I'm thinking right now, after I got past my stuttering thing, now I'm on a roll, I'm good now. You know what I'm thinking about right now? I gotta wake up tomorrow and do the same shit again. I gotta leave this interview and go stretch out for two and a half hours. I hate that shit. But guess what it does though? I'm constantly callousing over my victim's mentality that I once had growing up. Every day you have to do this Because why? When you stop doing it, you don't just maintain it. If you stop shooting a gun, you're not gonna be a great shot if you pick a gun up a year from now. The only way to keep from getting rusty is to constantly over that the machine. The machine is this. You gotta keep challenging it every day. I'm in search for a feeling. I'm not in search for a trophy. I'm not in search for love. I'm not in search for more followers on Instagram or social media. When I started this journey years ago, and I realized that I'm going to be somebody, and I'm searching for a feeling, a feeling of true victory for myself, and only myself. The second I shut out the whole world, 
and realize that one thing, that I am in this world alone. I'm fighting this race by myself. Yeah, I'm all about people, I'm all about team, I'm all about that. But I'm really all about right now and in my life, just like you said, no one knows the real truth about me, how hard I really go. I don't care if anybody knows. I don't want anybody to know. I'm an introvert. I live an introverted life. And I love that about me. It, that right there is my fuel. Is I know that there's really no one out there grinding like me. And if they are, so be it. If I know about you, I'll make sure that I up my gang. <laughs> That's what the mentality is all about. My whole thing is a mentality thing. Like I told you the last time I was on the show, I view myself as the weakest person on the planet Earth. My goal in life was to, in my mind, believe I'm the hardest man alive. And that's why the whole thing is, can't hurt me. That's what it's about. It's about whatever you think you are, you have to make that dream a reality. But that's where the hard part is, is making that dream a reality. The most powerful weapons I have, man, is a cookie jar. In, in times of need, even the hardest person forgets how badass they are. So I've been through a lot of shit in my life. When you're going through a hard time right now, you forget all the hard shit you endured. So the cookie jar is a reminder that, oh, I can get through this hard time right now, but you gotta take a second or two to reach into the mental cookie jar. Let's say it's a fortune cookie. But in my mind, my mom used to buy these cookies, you know, in the cookie jar, and it was an Oreo, or Chips Ahoy, whatever. That's where I got the cookie jar from. But you gotta open up and say, okay, man, I, I was in three hell weeks. And I got through two of them. You know, I was in ranger school. I, I, I endured being called nigger. I, I, I saw these beatings. I, 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 you know, my mom's soon to be husband got, got murdered. I saw all these things. I saw a little kid's head get ran over. All these things I endured alone. I have to remind myself of the strength and the power that I have that is in me. It's just a reminder of how badass you are in hard times because you know we just forget that that bad time consumes our mind mm -hmm. and we forget who we are. I think pushing yourself physically is the number one factor of life. That is the true spot where you can really dive deep into life's about self-discipline. It is about self-discipline. We tend to do the things that are easy. And that is the, it, it builds no mental toughness, it builds no mental hardening, it builds nothing. When you work out, working out is where you can build that the fastest. Because it's a constant, it gives you instant feedback. Instant, yeah, you may not lose the weight you want to real fast, but the discipline it takes, it transfers over to all aspects of your life. It's not, people, man, why are you always working out? Stop, stop looking at it that way. This is the foundation of life. When you look in the mirror, every morning we all look in the mirror to get ready to go to work, to go anywhere. The first thing you see is your reflection. If you don't like what you see in the morning, you lost the war already. It's not about even liking what you see. It's about looking in the mirror and you may start, man, I feel different. That reflection maybe not, that reflection is not everything. It's a feeling you're supposed to get. So you have to, in life, once you leave your house, the war begins. In your house, you have some control. And that reflection in that mirror, you have to control that reflection in the mirror. That's how you start your day. If you leave your house feeling like, okay, I can fight. I've established the mentality to fight. And that all that comes from working out. It's not just from, you know, you can't find that in the office. And I was 300 pounds. I didn't have any drive. I'm gonna go be a Navy SEAL. What kind of stupid shit is that, 300 pounds? There wasn't like a drive to go be a Navy SEAL. I was an insecure, lying kid, afraid. I had to look in my insecurities and in my fear and find drive in that. We're all looking for passion. Passion's all around you. You have a whole, a whole stack of it all around you. It's your insecurities, all that shit. You gotta dive deep in that shit. All, it's, it's all in there. All the energy and fuel you need is right in yourself. It's all there. You got a lot of stuff to do to overcome. And you know, that's where I found it. I found it right there in my own insecurities. I found drive in my own insecurities. And that's, that's the most powerful thing in the world. When you can find drive in your own doubt, fear, insecurities, 
you become very unstoppable. The most important conversation you'll ever have is the one you have with yourself. You wake up with it, you walk around with it, eventually you'll act on it. And my self-talk was the most disgusting self-talk of all time. So the sewer of my mind, like I said, you have to go back in there and fix things. A lot of us are afraid, like right now, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have found me on this show. I was too embarrassed to tell you I stuttered, I lied, all these different things, getting beat up, getting bullied, whatever happened. But that's where the true transformation starts to happen. When you can look at people, anybody, thousands of people, one person and say, hey, this is who I am. And this is where I have to fix myself. And this is where it really happened. I thought it happened when I was in, you know, 19, 18 years old trying to pass this military test. It happened here when I was almost 300 pounds spraying for cockroaches, making $1,000 a month. And, you know, people called me dumb. People, my dad called me so many things, it's not even funny. Being beat just stripped me of all self-esteem. This is when I realized I was alone on this earth. Yeah. I have God alone on this earth and I have to fix everything. So this is where I started to develop an indestructible mental toolbox. Okay. So I came home one night after spraying for cockroaches at Ecolab and literally I was praying at Steak and Shake and I would go across the street to 7-Eleven. I had a 45 minute commute home. So I worked from 11 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning. Okay. I had a 45 minute commute home and my, my stop would be you know, steak and shake, chocolate and milkshake, across the street, 7-Eleven, box of mini chocolate donuts, and I would eat that on the way home. Yeah, sure. When I come home, I turn the TV on, I take my shake because the box of donuts were, I mean, they were killed. Oh, yeah. I kill those. Yeah. Go back to the back, turn the, you know, turn the TV on and take a shower. Listen to the TV while I'm taking a shower. This day, I heard these guys on the TV talking about Navy SEAL, toughest, class 224, so I heard stuff about Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the baddest of the baddest. Yeah. And I'm, so I come out, and I'm watching this show while I'm drinking my shake. And when you're watching the show of guys who are putting out there, and they're quitting, quitting left and right. Oh, sure. Just can't handle it. They're going through hell week. They show them going through first phase, second phase, third phase, and they're dropping like flies. I looked in this one guy's eyes who was ringing the bell to quit, to put his helmet down out of Navy SEAL training, and I saw myself. And I saw what everybody said I was going to be, which was nothing. What I said I was going to be, that, that, that conversation you have, mm -hmm. that's who I was. So that's why I lied to people to tell them a different version of the truth. Sure. I had to make all those lies reality. I had to make them real. I had, I had to become a real person. So that's when I put in my mind that I'm going to go to the toughest military training on the planet. Mm. And where it has the most water, the thing I was scared of the most, mm -hmm. I had to go back. So a lot of us run away from our fears. Sure. And we box ourselves in to a, a lifestyle of this is all we can do. Because I'm afraid of everything outside this box. Yeah. So I'm comfortable inside this box. I jumped the box. Oh, you did? Yeah. For the first time in my life. Mentally, I jumped the yeah. box and said, hey, I, I, I got to come out here and play. Is there something that you want to be known for? The one thing that you want to stand out through all of these accomplishments and be remembered for? Um, honestly, I honestly want to be considered one of the hardest men to walk the planet Earth in the history of the world. And what I mean by hard, I'm not talking about the guy who does the most pull-ups, most sit-ups, runs the most. Just a person who's able to overcome any adversity in front of them, to figure out a way. Hardness isn't about all this physical shit, man. Yeah, it helped me get to where I'm at. But all I was doing in the whole process, the process wouldn't be ripped. It wouldn't walk around with my shirt off. That, that wasn't it. I knew through the physical challenges, through the physical suffering, my mind was getting stronger. I was literally doing that for a reason. I had a weak mind. All the rest just happened to come with it. I was trying to strengthen the mind to handle all the, the, all the judgment that's passed on me. Perceived and, and not. Sometimes you make it up in your own head. You know, I, I, I just want to be able to handle all of that. Everything. Physical, mental. I want to be perceived as that. Like an old school barbarian, an old school guy that's like, ah, dog, man. Nothing can hurt the guy, which is why the book is titled 
can't hurt me. I want people to have that mantra in their life. Take that with you. Take it everywhere you go in life. And if you believe that and you work towards that, callous in your mind, strengthen yourself, can't hurt me is strong. In any situation, like when I was in Buzz, they beat the shit out of you. I'd be the first one to get up and say, can't hurt me. And they were beating the hell out of me. But you say that enough to you. False motivation becomes real motivation after a while. Most of us live our entire lives avoiding failure. It's funny. I walk around, people come up to me and they say, man, you're that Navy SEAL you went through Ranger School. You were, you know, Air Force TAC-P. You know, you uh, did the pull-up record. You run all these ultra races, all this shit, man. The funny thing about it that I think about is this. They know that part of me. This is the part I know about myself. I felt the ASVAB test to get in the military three times. In the Air Force, felt at pararescue. In the SEALs, it took me three times to get through Navy SEAL training. The pull-up record took me three times. This is what I know about me. So what I'm saying is this. You can't live your life being afraid to fail. All those failures made me the success in the day. We're watching people fail because we're afraid to hurt their feelings. By no means do I condone bullying. I think it's bullshit. But I will say one thing. I believe in the truth and tell the truth. A lot of us have loved ones, friends, people we see every day who are gaining weight, getting out of shape, not going to school, being lazy, but we're afraid to tell them the truth. Not being bullies, but afraid to tell the truth. One thing that changed my life is my grandfather. He told me, you're going nowhere in your life, not being anything. As bad as that hurt me, it got me to pull my head out of my ass. So learn to stay hard, have thick skin, and do what's right. First right now is to continue. I used to have a wash rag when I did this. And you know how you take a shower, you have a wash rag and a cloth, and you, uh, you're sitting there and you're just lathering up, and before you hang your rag up, you want to get all the water to come on it, and you know, get it all, all that, all, you know, all the suds out of it. You want to wring it out, and you want to hang it up. So my big thing is, when I live my life, I want to make sure that when I'm dead and gone, that I wring that wash rag out, and that wash rag is my soul. And I also believe that we're going to end up one day meeting a maker, if you believe in one. And I believe that maker knows everything about you. Everything about you. Knows I was going to be here and talking to you. Knows everything. But you also have a choice to make. You have a choice to make, we have choices. And the one thing that scares me to death in my life is getting to heaven and not being what I was supposed to be. And I believe that God has a chart and he looks at the chart and he puts it in front of you when you get to heaven. He says, hey, this is what you're supposed to be. And one of my biggest fears in life was to see that chart and not have every block checked off. You know, I wanna make sure that I'm constantly pursuing whatever it is I'm pursuing just to be the best I can, just constantly grinding myself into a fine powder. I think we're all an underdog. I think I think the top CEO on the planet Earth still has that doubt. Yeah. I don't give a f where you're from. Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, the best on the planet. We're all underdogs. Whether you're an underdog because you put yourself there to be hungry or you're just a real life underdog. Right. We're all an underdog. And so this, this is about the mind and people discovering the mind, their own mind. And one thing I know is we all have an equation. We all have an equation. Like, you know, I'll talk about 3 point, you know, 3.14 is pi. There's different equations to figure out different kind of, you know, mathematical problems. We as human beings are mathematical problems. I cannot give you a book for every body in this world. That's what my book even though it's one book, it's tailored to the individual. It's not like you do these five steps, you're good. No, I'm helping you figure out your f equation because it's different. My equation is different from your equation. What's going to make you tick? What's going to make you go the distance? What's going to make you go to that spot in hell and say, I love this spot. It's okay. 
That's what this book does. It helps you figure out your 3.14. It helps you figure out your mathematical equation and say, oh, because once you figure out the equation in any math problem, you no longer fail, man. You got it figured out. What's the best advice you've ever received? I didn't receive any advice. And that's the thing about it. When I grew up, I just didn't receive any advice. My, my family was in such turmoil that the best advice I received is from myself. And, and that has to be to study yourself all the bad because the good's already there. You need to study that. Study, study the bad stuff about yourself and learn from that and grow. To get up every day or five days a week, whatever, when it's snowing, shiny, not, not shiny, not, not, not comfortable, and to go in the gym and work out when you don't want to go to the gym, it is not fun. And we want it very fast. If you don't see results in the first two days or the first week, I'm done. That's the mentality of most people. The struggle is too real. We're not patient. We Like in a world where you can Google the best restaurants around me right now, no one is patient. And for you to lose weight, for you to stop drinking, for you, whatever the hell you're going through, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of time, and a lot of pitfalls, a lot of plateaus. You're gonna hit so many plateaus. If you don't know how to get around that plateau, it's not gonna happen fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody wants the hack. Yeah, everybody wants the hack. There, there is no hack, man. Sometimes where the mind gets overwhelmed mm. and you cannot slow it down, but by these, these certain tools I developed, by not allowing your mind to get away from the moment. You cannot, you have to think about the exact moment that you're in. But I saw when I was younger, the moment became too big. Mm. When it became too big, I spazzed out and I would quit. But now I don't think about even like an hour from now, I'll be eating. I don't even go there. Because uh, then your mind, yeah, oh, no, we must embrace this because now there's, you have to be a leader in this moment. It's not about you just getting through it. I had six guys, I had five guys, and six including me, in my boat crew. Now as the boat crew leader. So now, another trick is this. If you don't think about yourself, there's no pain. Mm -hmm. Which can also lead to pain later on in your life. Mm -hmm. But in these moments when you're struggling, if you are a true leader, and you're worried about your men or women beside you, your mind doesn't care how cold you are anymore. Mm. Your mind's only worried about taking care of the men and women beside you. So I started realizing, man, if I take care of these cats to my left and my right, in the worst moments, my mind is no longer thinking about, you're miserable, David Goggins, get the hell out of here. You're thinking about, how was John? How was Andy? How was Sam? How was Pete? How, hey, how are you guys doing? You're not thinking about me. A buddy of mine calls me the other day and says, uh, he's having trouble running past eight miles. This is a guy who can run 30 miles any time of the day. So I tell him to come out to my house and we'll get some runs in. So he comes out, he goes, man, I'm telling you, I can't run past eight miles. But I realize in his life, he's had a new kid, more responsibilities at work, all this stuff. He's not thinking about this, I am. So I take him out for a run. We get 30 minutes into it. How far are we going, Goggins? I ain't tell him. Get an hour into it, I ain't tell him. Hour and a half into it, didn't tell him. So soon he shuts up. We run three hours. The guy does fine. Next day we go out there, he's able to run 20 miles again. So this is what happened to him. His circuit breaker blew. Our minds are very similar to circuit breakers. When they blow, you gotta figure out what it is. Sometimes you just add it too much to your plate. Go back in your mind and figure it out. Stay hard. What's the impact that you wanna have on the world? The impact I wanna have on the world is for everybody to be able to face who they are. I wanna have that kind of impact where you can go on TV. You can put your life on a billboard. You're not ashamed of who the f you are. You're not ashamed of what life made you, what you helped life make you. All that shit, all that bad shit that's now in this big pot that's stirring, you're no longer ashamed of it. You realize we're all f***ed up. Stop judging yourself against other f***ed up people who have hidden it better than you. That's all they've done. They've masked their sh better than you have, and now they're flipping it back on you and saying you're f***ed up. I want you to realize that this world, life, is one big head game. And once you learn to play the head game, it's no longer a game anymore at all. You can start living your life. I'm the only person in the history of the military who has ever gone through Air Force um, um, Tactical Air Control Party training, um, Army Ranger School, where I was an Army man, um, in three hell weeks. Yeah. 
So only person ever do that. But the reason why I did it was, when I was a young kid, I considered myself very weak, very weak. And as I started developing this indestructible mental toolbox, because what I realized was, the things I was like most afraid of, I cowered from. Mm -hmm. I had to start facing these things and becoming an expert at the things I feared the most. Yeah. I was afraid of my own mind. My mind would get off on these crazy places of what was me. Mm -hmm. my, my internal conversation wasn't great. Yeah. So I had to start mastering it. Once I started mastering it, in the horrible place I was at, I was literally, I consider myself the worst person ever alive. That was my conversation. But once I started mastering my own life, I started realizing, my God, man, this was in me? Yeah. I was a 300 pound fat guy. Now I'm 181 pounds, 190 pounds, whatever it was. I'm gonna go through all these hell weeks. Mm -hmm. So I started realizing the capabilities of the human soul and the human mind. Your biggest enemy, your biggest, the most important conversation you will ever have in your life is the one you have with yourself. You wake up with it, you walk around with it, you go to bed with it, eventually you're gonna act on it. Whether you're good or bad, you have to, that's why the whole thing about this book I have, it's about you. It is about you. It's strictly about you finding who you are. So many people die, live a hundred years, never know who they are. Never know who they are. You have to look in that mirror and know this, there's so much more in here, man. Because I can literally right now be a 300 pound guy spraying for cockroaches still to this day. If I did not look in that mirror and say, there, there has to be more to this. This can't be it. And then willing to go into it, dive deep into it and give all I have to find it. You become complacent. You become very civilized in life. You know, the worst thing that can happen to a person is you become civilized. When you get to that point where you believe that you've arrived, when you, my God, man, I'm up there near Michelle Obama on my book. I've done it, man. Mm -hmm. I'm good. You can coast. I can, I'm good. You don't man. have to do her. I ain't got to do her. You played your man card. The f I'm doing. I, I don't have to be a wildland firefighter, man. I retired from the military. I ain't got. I ain't got to go out there and dig fire line for three miles. I'm 43, man. I've done it. You should just be flying first class everywhere, everywhere and doing speeches and getting paid crazy cash. And laying in a hotel, kicking yeah. it, man. And that's exactly when it's over. That mindset right there to me is death. I'm not saying you can go as hard as you did when you were 20 or now at 43, but there's a new bar that you must always set in your life. And once you become complacent and you become civilized, you've arrived, you're no good for anybody. The one thing that only thing gets me mad nowadays is that so many people die with untapped potential because they think that someone else is better than them. And they were born, you know, not with the greatest tools. You don't need shit. You need the ability to grind your ass into a fine powder. And when you're in that fine powder, find a way to build that back up repeatedly. And it's possible. I'll tell you one thing. If you want to be great, you want to be the best ever at what you do, you can be misunderstood by everybody because you're going to be so obsessed and so driven to get there. That's what it takes. That's the truth. It takes every second of your life. Anybody says balance? Yeah, balance is important for a lot of people. It is. But if you want to go to that edge where people do not like you, don't understand you, question everything you do, you, you've arrived. When you are misunderstood to the point where people think you're psycho and you're nuts and you're this and that, why are you in the gym at one o'clock in the morning? You just got through doing an op for 13, 14 hours at the ranger school, man, at the gym. What's wrong? You will never understand what is wrong with me. And that's why I'm so glad you don't, because I'm in the right spot. When people don't understand you anymore, you're in that spot of obsession and drive, where people are like, what the f is wrong with this guy? I don't want to talk to you, man, because you're not going to get it. <laughs> you're not going to get it. Boom. They want you to get it. Yeah. They want you to get it. We all have a voice in our head. Some of us are very spiritual, some of us are not, but we all have this voice and you're doing This is wrong, don't do that. The more you don't listen to that voice, the further that voice gets away from your head. Some people call it the Holy Spirit, some people call it God, some 
mulch, whatever, whatever you call it, it's there. We all have it. Mm -hmm. It's the right or wrong voice. But the more we don't listen to it, the more that voice goes away. Mm -hmm. The only voice you hear is yourself. Mm -hmm. all, when the only voice you hear is yourself, you're wrong. There's a voice that guides you through life. When sometimes it's guiding you in a direction that you don't want to go, mm -hmm. that's usually the right place to go. It's that uncomfortable place. So that voice is always talking to me, but we don't listen to it. I listen to it. Unreal how much time you waste during the day. And most of it is on these fucking computers, phones, you know, Instagramming back and forth, whatever the fuck you call it nowadays, tweeting and texting and We waste so much time on our little gadgets. It's unreal. And we talk about we have no time. If you really take, you have to take your day and write, write down this one day. Everything you do, write that down. And you're like, my God, I am wasting so much time on frivolous bullshit. It's not even funny. I mean, it will, it will, if it doesn't infuriate you, it should. Because there's so much time. I can't get it in. Look at your schedule. You just wasted seven hours today on bullshit. I mean, and you don't have an hour a day to try to get something in for yourself. I guarantee everybody can find an hour. It's easy to look at you, and that guy's that guy is lit up on nope. anger and resentment. Even and rage. back in the day, so I gotta say, I've never said this before. I was actually telling my fiance this the other day. People think anger was my fuel. Just so, yeah, anger can be a fuel. Anger got me to look into things to become better. I want to show him. But I tell you one thing: when you're suffering and you're at the wit's end. And you want to quit? That anger is gone, brother. Well, it's you, also not a sustainable fuel no, source. Your mind is thinking about, let's get the f out of here. So I realized this anger ain't sh I didn't think about my dad beat me up. I didn't think about kids calling me nigga. I didn't think about any of that sh I thought about, man, this f water is cold as balls, man. I get the f out of here. So I realized anger was no fuel for me. It may have got me to say, I'm going to be somebody. Anger got me caught up in some serious ego trips, man. Take a different vantage point in life. Mm. When you are in the hell, you can't see the beauty of being in it when you're in it. Get on top of that mountaintop in your mind. Get on top of that mountaintop and look down at what you're doing. You can see a whole different world. That world is beautiful, but you got to get a different vantage point in, this, in the suck. Don't be in it. Spiritually, get out of it. Get that soul. Look down on what you're doing. Be amazed by the process of where you're at now and where you came from. What do you think is the biggest stumbling block that most people face with this kind of journey? Honestly, is they have the woe is me mentality. It's too hard. Life isn't fair. These things in life are, are, are not easy for me. You, you, you look to your left, you look to your right, and you start to judge yourself off other people. Like... If you're a female, well, she's skinny and she doesn't work out as hard as I do. And everything starts to corrupt your mind. You start to look around too much at other people and what they're doing. And that starts to corrupt your own dialogue. We are judging ourselves against too many people. You have to judge yourself against yourself. And that's the one thing I started learning, man. This isn't a race against me and Rich Roll. This is a race against David Goggins and David Goggins alone. And once you can silence all that bullshit, all the outside interference and things that are attracting your mind to everything, you can then start to grow in realizing I'm stressed out for no reason. This is my own little race. This is my own timeline. And this is how I'm gonna run it. Your mind has the ultimate tactical advantage over you. It knows what scars you. It, it, it knows your fears. It knows your insecurities. And it protects you. Which is why I talked about the 40% rule in my book. The 40% rule is all about the brain has the tactical advantage over you. It knows and it, it keeps you away from all that. That's why it says don't jump out of an airplane. Don't go in the ocean where there's sharks. It's a protective mechanism. Don't go back to the place where your dad beat the shit out of you in your mind. Don't go back. The brain protects you, but it protects you so much it doesn't allow growth. So the brain is an amazing thing, but the brain controls you. You must control it. You must take power over your own mind or your mind will guide you into all the soft spikes, soft places that your brain wants to live in. Mm -hmm. Your brain has enough information. It doesn't want to go through that process of, of mind hardening. It doesn't want to do that. 
I gotta remember what time I gotta be here, what time I gotta be there. This is where I wanna stay. I'm peaceful. He wants to stay very peaceful and away from scarring. When I was in sixth grade, I uh, stuttered real bad, severely bad. Fifth, sixth grade, fourth grade, horrible. Had, 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 like my hair would fall out, white splotches over my skin. Horrible, horrible anxiety. So me talking about myself as much as I am on stage, on podcast, I'm still overcoming, you're still battling, because it's comfortable for me to say, I'm off a of soda meat, they don't talk to me, I'm good. Go back to being my hermit. This is very uncomfortable, so I'm constantly coming outside my comfort zones and doing this stuff, now sharing my story with people as much as I can. A lot of successful people in this world who still feel empty inside, and they wonder why they still feel empty. So they try to make another million, two million, three million. Let's buy a new car, a new house, a new boat. Let's buy more of everything. At the end of the day, it still feels real empty inside. For me, I wasn't even feel successful. I just felt empty. So I was trying to hide my insecurities, my doubts, all this bullshit. So I was trying to dress up a turd. And when you try to dress up a turd, you're still a turd. It's like a turkey. You get a turkey for Thanksgiving. If you don't know what you're doing, you cook that without going inside and cleaning it out. You gotta clean the insides out before you start dressing it up. Same thing with life. If you don't get inside your soul, inside your heart, and fix it, be willing to go to war with yourself. No means am I an expert at this, but I do know a lot about living in the sewer of life. I've been getting a lot of emails from different loved ones about people who have killed themselves. My next door neighbor two months ago, she just killed herself. Tons of veterans I know, they killed themselves. I got an email two weeks ago from a family member that an 11 year old boy killed himself from people at school bullying him. One thing about life is that people in life, they are the ultimate puppet masters. They exploit your weakness and they love to walk you around life and own space in your head. One of the biggest ways to cut those strings and walk on your own two feet to your own destination in life is to build self-respect, self-esteem, self-discipline, all those things. Stay hard is not just about going to the gym. Stay hard is about going that extra step when you feel like you can't. That's what builds self-esteem and self-respect. Stay hard. So walk me through a day in the life. What's it look like right now? Well, I mean, it's gotta be crazy. Right now, I, I leave here and I fly out to Oregon and I'll be in Oregon with uh, Cameron Haynes. We'll be getting after for a few days. Uh, a lot more podcasts, a lot more interviews, but every day, Every morning I get up, I still get my run in every morning. How do you structure the training? The training is basically structured off of my schedule. So I look at my schedule and I say, okay, um, Jennifer, what do we have today? We have this at seven o'clock in the morning. Roger that. That means I gotta be up by four o'clock in the morning to run. That's how it works. That's how all my shit works. So she lays out the schedule of events. Two hours, you just, you just set it two hours earlier or whatever. She says it could take an hour to get to Rich Rolls. Let's say we were at seven o'clock today in the morning. It takes an hour to get to Rich Rolls with no traffic. Okay, let's, let's block in an hour 15 for Rich Roll. Okay, we got that. The morning time, I'm, I'm gonna run seven miles this morning. I need uh, 52.30 for that. Roger that, put in. Sh shower, shave, add that in. So the schedule dictates, but I have all that time. Always just push it back, right? Let's so if that back. means getting up at 1.30. Trust me. Roger that. I've done that several times. Yeah. <laughs> several How much sleep times. do you usually get? I, I like getting seven to mm -hmm. eight hours of sleep. Nowadays I can do that. But there's times where the, the schedule says, hey man, you're getting three hours. And if that's the case, right. Merry Christmas. If you're fat, you look in the mirror and say, wow, I eat a little too much. No, you're fat. My exoskeleton is larger than yours. Right. No, that's the new one, right? Yeah, that's. I mean, you <laughs> you cannot say that to yourself. No. But see, you have to make a list yeah. of the things that you don't like to do. Mm -hmm. This list should be very long. Like if you don't like making calls. Yeah. Yep. The very first thing you should do is start making a ton of calls. Yep. Because why? That begins to own you. Yes. You start to drive yourself this way versus this way. It, but you'll figure out, if you start making a whole bunch of calls, if you like calling, call a lot. Yeah. Guess what happens? You get over it. You get over it. 
So what we do a lot is, I, I heard a lot of people say, triple down on this, triple down on most of your strength. Yeah. No, 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 no. That works for a lot of things, but when you're afraid and you don't have the courage, mm -hmm. you have to triple down on your weaknesses and make that become where you start to guide yourself. Okay, I don't like calling. Today I'm making 100 calls. Yeah. I'm gonna dial 100 times. So I get the VFW award for the, uh, for the um, Americanism award for military service and giving back. I'm as human as human can be. That's why what you see is what you get. Um, at that moment when I was giving my speech, and I thanked my uncle for being there, and I got to my mom, it wasn't just about her. It was, I, 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 I know what she went through, I know what I went through, and we got knocked down so much. I had a moment in front of all these great American heroes where I had a chance, it was like so fast, it went through me like, like lightning. Of, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm getting the award like this. That, that kid who was in the fetal position, the majority of his life, and so much the fact that my body, my hip flexors are tight to this day, that even though I was standing erect, my mind was in the fetal position. And when I looked out amongst all those people, it was a sense of pride that <clears throat> I can't even, I can't even explain. It's the moments of three hell weeks. It's the moments of in that room by myself studying for hours and hours and I was trying to catch up with all the kids who were above me. <clears throat> it's just those moments, like the real raw moments of life that was like, boom, hit me and we're gone. But I was like, I did that, I overcame that. Shit. You know, it's like, it's this power behind all that. Shit. And that's the feeling I was looking for in my life. I found it. it wasn't money, it wasn't fame, it wasn't awards. It, it was that feeling I have right now. The feeling of, I'm about to break down, but it's not of like, oh my God, I'm upset. It's like I worked myself so hard that I turned a person this up into this right here. Not off of reading a book off a theorist, off of going to work on myself and saying, I don't know how to do this, but I know that to get over there to that side, I gotta grind myself into a fine power. And I did it. I did it off a of sure will. And very few people will know how that feels. Very few. Speaking of making that list, accepting where you're at so that you can address it, in the book, you talk about like what the things are that you're gonna be doing, you're gonna be putting the list together. How do people go about using, I don't know if it's the accountability mirror, how do they go about addressing each of those issues? Okay, so let's say the first one is, you're not the smartest person in school. I had that issue. So my big thing was how I addressed that problem was I had to sit down each thing that is wrong with you has to be a focal point. You can't look at this gigantic list and say, I gotta change all this shit. My God, this is crazy. No. You take off the first one. I wanna be smarter. For me, that was my thing. I have to, I have to become more intelligent. I have such a severe learning disability and I can't retain shit. I had to now get that one thing and then strategize in that one problem. How can I do this? I'm not gonna learn like you. I'm not gonna learn like anybody else. How am I gonna figure this out? So I then figured out, okay, where are my strengths here? Where are my weaknesses in learning? All right, man, how am I gonna do this? And I figured out a way to do it by just strategizing. So how I learn to this day, if I have a big manual to study, I will have to get a bunch of spiral notebooks from the, from the daggone store and each page, I have to write each page out, maybe 10 times. So there was a thousand page dive manual that I got 18 months before I went to dive school. Most people 
I'm not smart, I'm gonna go see if I can pass this test. I realized, hang on a second, I'm not smart. How can I get past this? How can I get through this obstacle? I need to get, I need to acquire this book 18 months in advance because it could take me 18 months to write down each page over and over again to then put it to memory. So when the question came up, I had written that question so many times down in that, in, on, you know, on paper that I can recall, okay, page 71 was where I remember seeing this and I can recall it that way. And that's how I did it. So you got to strategize on each problem you have in life. Slowly break down that problem. Don't think about all the problems you have, just one at a time. And before you know it, you fix all these problems, but you cannot focus on all of them. Just on the one thing at a time. The other day I got an email from this lady. She said she truly enjoyed my book, but as she read it, she thought I was just crazy. So after she read it, she put the book down and started living her normal life. Just going back, paying bills, going back to work, complaining about shit. A few days later, she has time to think about the book and it scared her. She thought, well, maybe this guy isn't crazy. And that's what scared her the most. Maybe he's here trying to show us human potential, what we're all capable of doing. A lot of people like to put titles on other people who are doing extraordinary things. It makes them feel better about themselves. Gives them a get out of jail free card. I'm not crazy, I'm just not like you. In sports, there's a thing out there called load management. A lot of us like to load manage our lives. When you do that, you can find yourself right at normal. Get off that, stay hard. You have to be on a constant reminder. Almost like how you put a reminder on your phone, 15 minutes you got this, that has to be in your brain. You've done too much, stop. And what happens in life is that we start to see our lives become so successful. We're making money, we're doing this, we're doing that. I want more, I want more, I push harder. I'm all about pushing hard, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Obviously. I'm all about it. But to push as hard as you can, you have to be mindful of the machine that's pushing. It is going to end up dying. And then it takes years to get it back so you lose that time. That time is gone. You know, I lost five years of, I could be crushing it. Where now I'm just now back to crushing it, realizing, God, man, I learned the hard way. That's really sometimes the only way to learn. That's why it was important for me to finally realize, stop being all these fake people I used to be, stop being afraid. There was no growth until I cut myself down to nothing, to the person I really was, the real human being. And once I found out who I really was, that's when I started growing. I was trying to build on top of a lied up foundation. You can't build a house on a up foundation. So I had, to, I had to get down to the actual mineral soil of who I was, and that's when you can start real growth. It knows that you have to have thick skin to get better. You have to call yourself out. If you're fat and you're up, I wanna hear that. I don't wanna hear you tap dancing around. And a lot of people don't want to go there. They don't want to talk about their childhood. They don't want to talk about their past. They want to get the root of the problems and then they go, why am I not getting better? Because there's a lot of shit in there you haven't dealt with, brother. You know, people go to the gym, like for instance, going through any kind of special operations school. These people go to the gym, they get big, they get jacked, they can run fast, all that shit. But the only thing they're doing is they're coding over the mind. All you're doing is building a bigger, stronger quitter. Your mind hasn't gotten any stronger because you haven't gone back in there and dealt with shit. So the second adversity comes, you're like, my God, I'm so fit. What's wrong? Your mind is still soft. I always talk about it. I talk about I'm always paying rent in that $7 a month place where I grew up, in that nasty little place I grew up in. I remember it. I remember like it was yesterday, and I'm glad I do. I never want to forget the dungeon of where I come from. Even though it's real spooky and it's scary and there's no lights on in there and there's cobwebs and some creepy in there, some demons, all those in there made me Goggins, made me who I am today. That's where the strength came from. You got to go back to the beginning, to, to the fundamentals of life, to the very fundamentals of where it all, like playing basketball. You got to go back to the fundamentals. You, just, you know, you can't always just stay up here. 
You got to go back to scratch. I had to stop caring what people thought about me. I realized that everybody's fucked up. That's the one thing I realized. I walked around and I put these people on a, on a pedestal. Everybody was better than me. So I can't tell you anything about me because you're going to judge me and I'm going to feel even worse than what I am. What I realized, once I calmed my mind down and sat back and looked at how jacked up this world is, once you realize that you are not alone, everybody that's talking to you about how jacked up you are, only thing they've done better than you is they've hidden their f***ed up world better than you have. That's all they've done. So once I realized that, if you want to sit back, like for instance, there's all these things that are on TV and we have all these news people judging people who f up in life. Yeah, they made big mistakes. But that person who was judging you on TV, I guarantee you that that news person, they say, I'm glad that my sh didn't come out. <laughs> but I'm going to judge the hell out of you. I know that about people. So if you want to sit back and judge how jacked up I was and how messed up my life was, Merry Christmas. Go for it. Have a good time. But I'm smiling at you right now knowing you have a secret that you're not willing to share. It gives you a lot of power when you're able to go on a podcast this big and say, hey, tell me, I'll tell you anything you want to know. I no longer care. And that is a lot of power in that to be able to put your life on a billboard for the whole world to see and say, judge it, man, judge it. Like just me talking about it makes me feel good.